following is from Bill in Rockford, Illinois. There's a house here in north central Illinois known to the locals simply as the Penfield Place. The house's eerie legacy began back around the turn of the century when a kitchen fire took the lives of two small children and a servant. Next, an undertaker took up residence, whose wife fell headlong down the main staircase there, breaking her back and her neck, killing her instantly. The funeral director's body was discovered a few months later in his own backyard, swaying from the branches of a maple tree where he had hanged himself in despair. Then the real tragedy commenced. A newlywed couple by the name of Penfield bought the place, moved in, and one night, not long after, the young bride, Mara Penfield, went missing. The jealous husband was always suspected in her disappearance, but nothing ever came of it, not until a decade later in the 1940s, when 17-year-old Mara Penfield was finally found again. Her sad remains were unearthed by some workmen in the backyard of her former home, buried beneath that infamous maple. She'd been stabbed, rolled up inside an oriental carpet, appendages dismembered and removed to only God and the killer knows where. Her missing limbs were never found. After that, the house went really bad. Future tenants would experience a frightening presence there, one which loomed over them as they slept and circled the bed, sometimes even touching their extremities inquisitively. A soft voice could be heard whispering, Am I dead? Am I dead? And once an abomination was witnessed by a group of New Year's Eve revelers, a hideous shape crawling across the second floor stair landing in the darkness as if searching blind for something. When somebody let out a scream, the form raised up suddenly and glided away, nightmarish and black with no face to speak of. The large dwelling eventually fell victim to neglect and was converted into a tenement room and boarding. But I can distinctly remember once in the 1970s when a young expectant mother living there broke out in a high fever one night and miscarried inside that same shuttered house, giving birth afterward to a stillborn boy at a nearby hospital. A stillborn baby boy, extremely misshapen and underdeveloped, no legs, no arms, the rambling old Penfield place still stands today, decaying and in ruins, a monument to all our very worst fears as human beings. The following is from Joan in Ferndale, Washington. During the 80s, I worked for a university in the Department of Journalism that had offices in an old Victorian house located off campus. A beautiful old structure with three floors and a widow's walk overlooking the bay. It was during the summer, and the faculty was gone, and I was left alone attending to the routine of the office. At first, I noticed a child crying, but upon checking, found no one. However, the desperate sound would continue over the summer, often interrupting my work. My office was located on the second floor in what used to be a bedroom, down a long hall with a Palladian window at the head of the stairs. It became increasingly difficult to mount the stairs, pass the window, and go to my office as I had to pass through an atmosphere that was chillingly cold and somehow thick. On the third floor was what used to be a servant's quarters, but were now used for storage. I had the keys to all the rooms, was not able to open a door that was located at the end of the third floor hall, though I tried repeatedly. My friend, who was intensely interested in all paranormal things, expressed an interest in investigating the old house. That Saturday was gray and wet, thoroughly depressing, made, made even uh, more so by the house. We entered, went room to room, my friend feeling nothing until we reached the third floor. Amazingly, she was able to unlock the door that I'd been unable to, and she did it with ease. It swung open to reveal a room papered in a yellow floral hanging in tatters, ragged curtains at the window. Upon the floor, in a thick layer of dust, was a child's tiny footprint. My friend said, we've got to get out of the house now. Taking a piece of the torn paper before I shut and lock the door, we left, fighting our way, fighting our way down the stairs through what appeared to be a whirling, cold vortex. Hand over hand, gripping the banister, we forced our trembling feet step by step until we thankfully reached the lower hall. 
backward glance revealed three columns of a gray fog interspersed with pinpoints of light. I was shaking so badly I could hardly insert the key and lock the old front door. Later, my friend took a piece of the wallpaper to a psychic who informed her it had come from a nursery. The child, a little boy, had fallen down the stairs and broken his neck. His mother had gone insane with grief, had been locked away in, a, in the third floor by her husband, an abusive man. The three continued to haunt the property. Even though the house was torn down and the land turned into a parking lot, still, late at night, if you look carefully as you drive by, you can see a gray-blue light spiraling up from the pavement. Well, Cardline, you're on the air. My name is Jessica, and I am from Victoria, B.C., Canada, originally. And my story is about there. Um, a couple years ago, I was going to art school and um, had a part-time job at a grocery store. And um, a part of our art lessons were to go out into various parts of Victoria and, like, draw buildings and such things like that. So one field trip we had, we went to a, a grave site, and we started drawing, you know, tombstones and stuff. So I remember I sat down. Sorry, I'm older. <laughs> Anyways, I sat down, and I started drawing um, this tombstone, and this lady, um, it was a lady's name on there. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I started drawing it, and that's not the whole story. But a couple weeks later, I'm working at the grocery store, and... I worked, I was pretty much the only one there. It was a really small grocery store. And I'm sitting there with another cashier, and in walks this lady. And I can't see her because I have my back to the door. But the other cashier that I was working with, like, we're talking, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me like she was so freaked out. So I turn around, and I look, and I see this weird lady with this long black dress on. I'm not I'm totally not lying. She was wearing this long black dress, long straggly hair, gross looking skin, like gray, grayish tone. And mm. like, I'm an artist, so I can tell like people's skin tones. Anyways, she freaked me out so much. Like that was not what regular people looked like. So I screamed and ran away. That was like my first instinct was to just scream and run away. I couldn't believe it. And once I realized that I had screamed and ran away from this lady that I'm supposed to help, like I'm in a grocery store, I realized this, I went back and said, I composed myself and I said, um, can I help you? <laughs> and she's like, I don't know where I am, like in this really creepy voice. So oh I was like so freaked out by this lady. I looked at her and I was really close and her eyes looked like they were just held up by two sticks. Like it was like bugging out of her face mm. and she's i said you don't know where you are let me call you a cab so i said what's your name and she said it's elizabeth and just a couple weeks earlier when i was drawing this tombstone i um, i remember what the name of that lady was and there were fresh flowers there and it looked like it was a fairly fresh grave and that name was elizabeth mm. and i was so freaked out by this lady like she did not look like she was walking. She looked like she was floating, like she had no footsteps at all, and just, like, shook me up so much. And it's been, like, five years, and I still get creeped out when I think about her. Maybe by drawing that uh, tombstone, you essentially called Elizabeth. I have no idea, but I do know that Victoria, where I'm from in Canada, in the whole Pacific Northwest up there is really, really big on witchcraft and like, I don't know if I had just seen, you know, that parallel between the living and the dead, but that person that I saw that, like, hovered at me right. was not human. And I don't really tell that story very much because, like, you know, obviously I don't think people are going to take me seriously, but my first instinct, and I heard you were talking about this earlier, Art, was to scream and run. <laughs> and I did, and I don't do that with people who are living and alive, you know? I hear you. All right. Thanks for the story. I, I really appreciate it. I, you know, if something like that happened to me, if an obviously 
dead person was in front of me, floating in front of me with gray skin, eyes that just didn't look, I don't know, human, alive human. I'd scream. I'd run. I'm sure I would. Mr. The Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. This is uh, Elliot out of uh, Arizona. Yes, Elliot. Uh, when I was uh, like nine, ten years old, uh, my mother and my grandmother and we all went on a picnic and uh, out in the country to this lake. And uh, as it was getting dark, uh, well, we decided to leave. And uh, my grandmother took the wrong turn. And uh, she didn't realize it. And we were traveling uh, down this dirt road for a long ways. And she realized that she uh, went the wrong way. And we pulled up to this driveway. And by this time, it was night. And there was a glowing pillar uh, that we noticed off the side of the road. It was like bluish-white pillar. <laughs> and uh, we started driving up closer to it. And uh, I remember my mother started screaming, uh, back the car up, you know, and she started beating her hands on the dashboard, and we could see it was a, uh, an apparition of a woman, and it was drifting towards the car. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so we get the heck out of there. <laughs> but you also saw it. Yeah. And it was indeed an apparition of a woman. Yes. All three of us seen it. All right. And so you beat feet and got out of there. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you very much, as I would do. Wild Card Line, you're on the air. Good morning. Okay. Hi there. Hi. I got a good one for you. Fire away. Okay. Um, my family owned a funeral home about three years into my career. Done plenty of removals, went to plenty of hospitals, been in plenty of morgues, been in plenty of homes. But this one uh, uh, peculiar situation came up where we were actually contracted, hired, to uh, remove a man from a hospital who was uh, being frozen, cryonics. I don't know how familiar you are with that. but uh, Oh, I know about the procedure, sure. And, uh, yeah, so I was on death watch that, that night. He was actually close to death for three days. And uh, it was just a matter of waiting for him to take his last breath for the... Uh, the doctor to actually pronounce them, and then they give him the lethal shot of, uh, of barbiturates and hook him up to a, a respirator, a heart-lung respirator, which actually pounds on his chest. Well, we did that, and uh, not even thinking anything of it, I, I we did the removal. I put him on the gurney, strapped him to the gurney. This machine's pumping. But if I, I might, let me stop you for a second. Um, I, I don't quite understand the procedure. In other words, the doctor pronounces him dead. Correct. Okay, but then he's given a lethal shot. Lethal, uh, lethal inject, yeah, a lethal injection of barbiturates. Why would cocktail. that be? Why would that be necessary? Well, um, if, from my understanding, because the heart lung machine is put on uh, almost immediately after he's pronounced oh, okay, dead. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, and and I ask the same question. I mean, I'm thinking the same thing, but I'm not really thinking this until until about what I'm about to tell you actually uh, happens. Sure. Uh, anyways, I put him in the car. He's in the gurney. We're in the we're in the uh, the station wagon. The machine's pumping in the back, and I you know turn on the radio. And I'm, I'm just driving along. All of a sudden, in in my mind, I hear a, like kind of a moan. And I look in the rearview mirror, and I was, and I shook my head and no. And then uh, again, I heard this. Where are we going? And uh, I look in the rearview mirror, and it was kind of like a ghostly image, but it was like uh, I, I turn around and it's not there, but I see him actually like, sit up. And uh, I turned around, and I shook my head, I said, no. I said, this is in my head. And I turned the radio up. And as I turned the radio up, it got louder. Where are we going? And I, pull, I pulled the car over, I put it in park, and I said, and I turned the radio off. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Like, right. And, and no, I said it out loud. I said, you have got to be kidding me. I said, I've been doing this for three years. And I said, I do one thing that uh, is different, and, and uh, can you hear me talking? He goes, yeah, where are we going? My God. I said, uh, I said, uh, well, we're going to the funeral home. He goes, no, we're not supposed to go to the funeral home. I said, uh, well, where are we supposed to go? He goes, I'm supposed to just wake up uh, and be, be well again. I said, wow. I said, this is wrong what we're doing. He goes, well, what have I done? And I explained it to him. I, I actually, I'm sitting there in the car talking. So to you're him. having a full conversation with a, a dead full, man. 
Well, you know, that's the, going through my head. I was like, well, is, is he dead? Um, well, in, I, in, if I you're look, having that I kind of conversation, I'm sorry. I'm, if you're having that kind of conversation, um, uh, I'd be turning around or something. I mean, I did. I turned around every time I would turn around. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I don't mean turn around the in the car. I mean, turn around and head back to the hospital. If you're having that kind of conversation with somebody, anyway, you go ahead, sir. No, I know it was. It wasn't. It was wasn't with him in his physical body, though. Uh huh. Because in the mirror, I could see him sit up, and I can and I can mm-hmm. and I can visually, you know, see kind of see him. Yeah. But uh, when I turned around, it, the machine's just going. But I, I, the weird thing was, is I didn't feel fear. You know, I, I thought I, as I look back, I said I should have been running out of the car screaming and yelling. Yeah. But this guy, and I knew this guy was, he was stuck because he realized, and I realized, I felt horrible because we got paid a lot of money just to just to put this machine on this guy and then bring him back to the funeral home, pack him in ice and put him in an ambulance to be put into um, right. uh, uh, nitrogen. Right. And uh, the thing is, is I actually had to coerce him to go, because he was going to stay. He was going to stay in the funeral home. And my dad, I really haven't told this story to anybody, but my dad asked me, he goes, what's, he goes, what's wrong with you? I said, what we did tonight was, was wrong. I said, this man, is what he's expecting of this cryonics is, is not, I know for sure, is not going to work. Because, and he's stuck. He was stuck. Obviously, this man thought it was going to work. Yes, he did. And, uh, yeah, he was going to stay. He was, he was hanging out at the funeral home when the, when the ambulance took off. I said, you can't, you can't stay here. Well, what do I how, do? I don't now, know. how did you finish up the conversation with the man? I'm sorry? How did you finish up the conversation with the man? With with uh, telling him that he must go with his body in the ambulance, and he needs to figure out his path. I mean, it was weird, but uh, I told him that he couldn't. I've never dealt with anything like this before, and he couldn't stay with me. It wasn't like he wanted to stay with me. He was stuck. It was like 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 traumatic for him. It was That'd like be the traumatic. last body I'd ever drive. <laughs> But uh, it was it was it was freaking. That was the last cryonics uh, situation we put ourselves into. Huh. That's an amazing story. Uh, just absolutely amazing. And how you kept your cool through that, I'll never know. It was it was it was strange because I didn't in my mind and throughout my career I had actually put it out of my mind. I said, you know what? There's got to be no such thing as ghosts because I deal with bodies every day, uh, uh, fresh deaths. Uh, in situations and, and and I've never ever anything and when that's when when I heard him say where are we going and I saw him sit up in the rearview mirror oh, I yeah, pulled yeah. over and I said you've got to be kidding me I hear you <laughs> all right sir I really appreciate the story thank you thank you I, I, you know maybe there's something different about the expectation of a spirit that was. Um, well, frankly, expecting to wake up in good health. In other words, he was expecting to be cryonically frozen and to wake up one day in the far future uh, healthy and probably wealthy if he had good investments. Uh, But instead, he woke up on the way to the cryonics lab, neither here nor there. That is a freaky story. Hi. Hi. My name is Candy, and I'm calling from Sacramento. Yes, Candy. Well, my story is a pretty scary one. I haven't told many people this throughout my lifetime. I'm 36 now. Mm-hmm. And I remember the weather was hot, so it must have been around June or August in the summer months from school. And I was in the sixth grade. And the family was um, on vacation and um, at home. I I didn't go with them wherever they went to. I can't remember that now. But uh, Grandpa stayed with me, and he was in the living room, and I was coloring at the dining room table. Mm -hmm. And I had one of these old um, organs in my room. And down the hallway, I could hear this music coming from the organ, and I knew I didn't leave it on, and it didn't play by itself. Right. And it was, it was beautiful yet eerie, and I kept coloring, and I thought, 
well, it's going to end anytime soon, but it kept going, and I kept more curious about it. So when I went down the hallway, there was this chill in the air, and Grandpa had told me a couple of months previously that if I were to experience anything scary, just to call on the name of Jesus, mm-hmm. and everything would be all right. And I was getting scared or by the moment I kept walking up the hallway to my room, and I called on the name of Jesus, but it didn't go away. Did you get into the room? I got so close to the doorway that the music was blasting my ears. And what happened was I... I didn't know what to do, and I and I didn't want to go back and get Grandpa because I thought I could handle this by myself. And then I can I, I, I can hear you. I can actually hear the fear in your voice as you're telling this. I I I've been listening since 1998 to you and George Nori. And this is the first time that I've ever been able to get onto the radio to tell my experience. Okay, so what finally happened? Uh, did you did it just stop or what? No, it, I, when I turned into the doorway real fast, like there was this thing that I can't describe to anybody, but I have drawn pictures of it to. Uh, okay, well, try. You're going to have to give it a try. This thing, um, yes, non-human thing. I guess if it was human, you wouldn't say thing, would you? No, it was unearthly. I I have no de- formal description of how to put into words what it looked like, but it was it was red. Uh, oh. And it it was glowing. Oh. And it 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 must have been a demon that I saw. Did it have a did it have a form uh, a body arms legs that kind of thing or any appendages at all uh, Yes and it, it was using its its hand like fingers on my organ player yes. Yikes And it looked straight at me with yellow eyes Yellow eyes And red with yellow eyes Yeah it was it was the most unbelievable undescribable being and i'm shaking right now but i can hear it 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 challenged me at the age of six years old so it i said in the name of jesus christ be gone i command you and it lifted its head up like it had never been told this before and just vanished. Whew. All right. Well, that's some story. Um, that's some story. And those are some words from a six-year-old. I, I really appreciate your call. Well, thank you for taking my call. Well, thank you for making it and take care. <sighs> Yellow eyes, huh? Art, longtime SWL, ham, and coast fan. That means shortwave listener. Thought about telling you about this one for some time, so here goes. Back in 1978, I, I was driving out in a secluded rural area sometime after midnight on a date with a young lady. We parked on a deserted country road, talking and enjoying each other's company. When we noticed all the dogs and coyotes in the area were howling like crazy, so much so that we were a bit spooked at this point. It was well past the time that she was supposed to be home. I started out of there, driving her on home, which was nearby, well out in the boonies. We approached her house from the long way round, as she didn't really want to go home yet. But I was anxious to get her home, lest we both get in hot water with her parents. Anyway, we were rolling slowly toward her house, and we approached an old church. It was about an eighth mile from her house. It was such an old church that it had a graveyard in the back of it, as it was practiced years ago. Remember that? Anyway, my date suddenly said, look at that. I looked, and I saw what appeared to be a woman crossing on foot from the old church across the road 
in front of our path, so I slowed the car to a near stop and the, in quotes, woman, crossed the road probably not more than 50 feet in front of the car. But in the headlights, I could see it was a woman in a nightgown and nightcap of the old style, but she was floating about two feet off the ground and had no legs. I could also see that her eyes were just dark holes, no eyes visible. She never looked at us, but just stared straight ahead. My, my date was totally freaking out by now. I was so astounded, this part grabs me, that I stopped the car and popped the door open thinking I would jump out and get a closer look at this thing. But my date, having none of it, screamed at me to get us the hell out of there. The woman continued on across the road, passing right through rows of vines that grew parallel to the road. My girlfriend was just about hysterical at this point, made me promise to sit outside her house for a while, make sure nothing was around. That was the most fantastic thing I've ever seen. And believe me, Art, an absolutely true story. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the program. Thank you. What is your first name? I'm Sandy. Sandy. All right. Where are you, Sandy? Juneau, Alaska. Juneau, Alaska. Has, yes. Has it begun to get cold up there yet? Well, we've had a couple of real hard frost, 20 degrees mm, at night. Oh, well, that's cold. But, but uh, right now it's around in the 50s. So, And we have a lot of rain. You know, we're a rainforest. Oh, here. I know. I know. People, most people think Alaska's uh, all equals. Well, Juneau's, you know, way down there. Yeah. The capital and all that. And it's right on the ocean, and we get a lot of warm currents. People don't know that your town is accessible only by air or sea. I mean, that's it, right? That's correct. <laughs> they keep saying they're thinking about building a road, but um, it would be a very expensive project. Yes, it would. So Juneau is a very isolated town. Yes, Any, yeah. Anyway, what's your story? Well, this occurred about 20 years ago. I was going through a really bad divorce. There was a lot of violence in the marriage and stuff. And, and uh, the doctor had given me some medication to help me sleep. Mm -hmm. Now, I was lying in bed, and I was lying on my stomach. And all of a sudden, I, I felt a very heavy pressure sit on the side of the bed right next to me. And I tried to get up to, uh, you know, I was concerned that it was my soon to be ex-husband, maybe sitting next to me or whatever. Sure. But I was trying to turn around to see, but I couldn't. And all of a sudden, um, I heard this. Um, it was like a woman's laugh, and it, like a woman who was a really heavy smoker. Uh -huh. And she laughed. A and, raspy laugh. Yes. Very, very uh, gravelly sounding yes. is what I call it. And... Um, I tried to sit up again, and she it was like she flung herself backwards on top of me and was just laughing and laughing. So I tried to reach uh, my arm around, and I uh, grabbed the hair on the head, and I pulled it, and the head came off. Oh, my God. And so I'm holding it by the hair, and... I look at it, and it's just a, a real wrinkly old face. And Most people would be inclined to drop it like a hot potato. Well, I, I fainted, actually. But be, uh, uh, well, anyway, it started, it woke up while it was in my hand, and that's when I fainted. What, say what? It woke yeah. up in your hand. And so then I, I, I came to, my, my dog was, whimpering and sniffing at me. Well, hey, I'm with you. I'd faint, too. I'd faint. Dead out. Yes, I did. Yeah. And um, I, when I woke up, there were a few strands of hair in my hand. Oh, my God. And so I, for a minute there, I wanted to throw them away, you know, to just throw them out and get rid of it right, right. away. At but, the very least. But th I thought, you know, I'm going to put them on the nightstand. And um, so I did, and... And I, I sat up in bed for a long, long time. Finally, the dog fell asleep, and she seemed pretty calm. And so I went back to sleep, fortunately. And so I woke up in the next, mo the next morning, 
and um, I remembered what had happened. And I looked over to the dresser where I'd put the hairs, yes. and they were gone. <laughs> and, but I was so very terrified. Oh, that. my God. Well, I, that's, that qualifies as one of the worst I've heard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Take care. Oh, now that's bad. That's really bad. You grab at a ghost's hair, and you grab it by the hair, and the head comes off in your hand. And then the head wakes up. And then our caller faints, and I don't blame our caller a bit. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, good morning. It's a uh, p- pleasure to finally get a hold of you and uh, be able to talk to you. Also wanted to say uh, your family's always uh, in our prayers. Thank you. Uh, what is your first name? Dwight. And Dwight. We're in Colorado Springs, and we listen to you on KVOR uh, on uh, 740. All right. Excellent. Proceed. We thank you. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's. Rather strange, it started uh, as a child. I have a twin brother, and uh, my mother had uh, tried to commit suicide, and uh, we Sorry. we were clear at the other end of the house. Mm-hmm. It's sleeping, and we both got up, went to the door, and saw her in there, and we went out to shake her, and she kind of looked up and looked at both of us and then just dropped her head. And being kids, we didn't know what the hell to do except run in and, you know, hey, Dad, Mom's dead, I think, you know, and that during that period of time uh, we went to uh, uh, family and friends and that night we came back home and we're laying there in bed and I'm looking in the hallway I mean I just couldn't sleep and uh, I seen the head of my mother no lower no nothing below the neck just the head Hmm. and it comes right at me and I didn't even find out until just recently. My twin brother saw the same thing. Really? And really? That's like the third story like this tonight. You both saw the same thing. The same thing. And what was funny is because it was proportional to what the head size would be in the hallway. Right. And it would come towards you and get bigger and bigger until it just like encompassed you and went right past you. And uh, huh. then other times, uh, well, in her house, where her mother's house, uh, I would be, as a kid, be looking across the street, and I don't don't I don't want to call it shadow people because I don't know what to call it. It's just a feeling you get from looking at a certain area. Yes. And I would go through the kitchen, and there's this little face of a sailor boy. It's a like a ceramic piece, and every time you looked at it, there was it was almost like it was somebody. And uh, just the other night, I was just sitting here going through the uh, uh, well, let's uh, well the your your uh, coast to coast website. Yes. And I just felt this real hard nudge on my shoulder, and I thought it was my wife. And I just looked up like she was right there, and there wasn't nothing there. I, I understand. Well, all right. You see, all of this seems to go, he happened to be on the website, which means he was on a computer. And more and more now, we're associating the paranormal with a different vibrational state. We've talked about this a few times on the program. When you're sitting at a computer, you're receiving uh, a certain frequency, you know, 60 hertz, 70 hertz, 80 hertz, whatever you've got your uh, computer refresh rate set at. And that's slowly beginning to affect your brain and allowing you to function at a slightly different vibrational rate. So I think in the computer age, the modern age, we're going to begin to see more and more uh, of that which we could not previously see for exactly that reason. Wildcard line, you're on the air. Ghost to Ghost AM. Hi. Hi, Art. How are you? I'm fine. This is Pat in Houston. Pat in Houston. Hi, Pat. Are you having a happy Halloween? Uh, well, it's a my, ghostly Halloween. That's right. I prefer uh, exactly what we're doing right now, Pat. What's up? Well, this is a st- story that happened to me several years ago. We had some very good friends, and our husbands. Um, decided to go hunting one weekend. My friends had just been able to buy a brand new house in a very plush, exclusive part of Houston. Uh And uh, it was a very expensive house, and we were very young, and so I wanted to go spend the night and see how her house was. Sure. Okay, so it was raining that weekend, like it can rain in Houston, in the coastal areas, you know, it just rains and rains, and, and, um, our uh, husbands went on and went hunting, but 
My friend had told me that I may not want to stay with her that night because weird things had been happening in her house. And I told her, oh, you know, nothing scares me. Mm. I was young then. Mm -hmm. And I welcomed the time to uh, go spend with her and her daughter. (laughs) So we ate supper, and it got dark, and we went to bed. Well, their house was a long, contemporary branch-style house with one big bedroom on one end and the living room in the middle and the kitchen on the other end with an attached garage. Well, we, we talked for a while, and then we went to sleep. And I woke up all of a sudden. Both of our daughters were just screaming loudly. Uh-huh. They were in a little nursery that was kind of attached on the side of the bedroom we were in. Yes. So I um, I jumped up to go see what was wrong with them, but as I was getting out of the bed, I felt a cold, cold feeling just start from one side of me on my right side. And it must have taken maybe 10 seconds to go pass all the way through my body. It was the coldest that I've ever been in my life. It's just really hard to describe. And you could actually feel it moving across your body. Oh, yeah. It was like you were just, I don't know how to even explain it. You were just frozen. You just couldn't do anything except experience that really terrific coldness. You're doing fine. Yes. And so it left, and um, I got up to see what the girls were doing, and they were quiet by then. But as I was checking them, there was a terrible pounding on the living room front door. And so I started to go to the front door, and my friend started just sobbing, just saying, please don't go to the front door. Don't go. Don't go. It won't do any good. And I was like, well, I'm going to go see who's at the door. Well, then the pounding kind of moved around to the garage door. You're like every lady who dies in any <laughs> horror flick I've ever seen. Yeah, sure. Let's go to the basement. Well, let's, oh, go, let's open go open the door. Oh, let's go out there with the yeah, picture knife, right? right? That, that's right. That's right. So you <laughs> go to the door, huh? Right. So I go. I headed through the kitchen to go to the garage door because that's where the pounding was. Well, then the pounding stopped there, and I looked over to my right, and those there were big patio doors looking out at their big backyard. And there was huge, just pounding, just frantic, pounding, pounding, like the glass would almost break. Yeah. But when I looked, there was nobody there. So by this time, I was really kind of afraid, and my friend was going, Well, it's about time. Just come back, you know. (laughs) Don't go. But I did. I called the police. I called 911 and got the police. And uh, it was a very exclusive part of Houston, so they were there as fast as you could put the phone down almost. And uh, I let them in to the house because um, they wanted to check it out. And my friend was going, oh, please, please, no one is here. Just just won't do any good. She was hysterical by then. Yeah. But the police checked um, the doors, and they, they decided to walk around the perimeter of the house. Well, it had been raining so much. There were no footprints outside at all. Right. But they could hear the pounding on the garage door to the kitchen. So they came into the garage, to the kitchen, and tried to open the garage door. Yes. They could not even wedge that door open. My friends had not unpacked all their boxes, and the garage was just stuffed to the rafters with packing boxes. Uh So bad that the police could not even wedge the door open. Right. So they said, well, we'll go check around at the patio door. So they went to look there, and there had... There was nobody there at all. But when the policemen saw my friend, they remembered that they had been there once before. But they had uh, never been able to find anybody at the house. Uh-huh. So um, my friend said, okay, you can leave. You know, it'll be okay now. We never hear this more than once a night. So I said, what do you mean? You never hear this more than once a night. Well, it seems that the original owner that had the house yes. had uh, hung herself in the kitchen. <sighs> this and is like the third or the fourth suicide. Uh, it seems like suicides, for some reason, are more likely to remain than others. That should be telling. That's a strong message, I think. So she had hung herself. She hung herself in the kitchen. And... Her husband had been, he traveled a lot, or he went hunting like our husbands did. He was not home an awful lot. Yes. But when he got home that night, he tried to get into the house, and it was all bolted on the inside. And he went around to the patio doors and looked into the kitchen, 
and he could see that she was hung, that she was dead, hanging. So he shot himself in the backyard that night. Oh, my God. And that's what we think the pounding on the door was, was his ghost trying to get in to help her. All right. I really appreciate your story. Thank you. And there's so many aspects of that that I think are right on the money. <sighs> The fact that there are already tonight, how many have we heard that were suicides? So that must mean there's a greater chance. It must mean there's a greater chance for suicides to remain or be forced to remain. We don't know the nature of the other side or even that that represents the other side. It may be a kind of a hellish place where people who do that kind of thing commit suicide remain. I don't know. And the other, of course, is that things continue to repeat. It may well be that the hell you enter when you do something like that is that you are then forced to repeat for eternity. I'll put a question mark there. That act that got you there. Night after night after night. East of the Rockies, uh, you're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Hi. Hi. How you doing, Art? I'm fine. Uh, what is your first name? My name is Rob. Okay, Rob. Well, uh, my story that I have for you tonight uh, concerns some incidents that occurred to me when I was stationed at the Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Portsmouth, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, the uh, hospital has an interesting history. Uh, it was built in 1830, was the very first naval hospital ever built. Mm -hmm. And the building that I was in was... Uh, the, the original hospital building. They called it Building One. And when we first got to the command there, they uh, told us a few stories. And uh, one of them they told us was about a specter that they called the Lady in Red. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, this had to be uh, a nurse that was supposedly uh, worked on a surgical unit there during the Civil War, mm -hmm. and she had apparently hung herself on the fifth floor of the building there, which was the old surgical unit. Mm -hmm. um, how she got the term Lady in Red, we never quite understood, but uh, they told us when we first got there that there were strange things that would happen periodically, not to be alarmed. So, In other words, they just got used to a presence. Yes, yeah. more or less. Yeah. So... Uh, the first thing that I had that happened to me, uh, the first unit that I was assigned to, and I did work in the psychiatric unit, which was stationed on the third floor. Strange enough anyway. Yes, yes I, I, was a, I was a medic in the Air Force. Thank really? You. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, then you know a little bit. A little bit. About it. So at any rate, this um, first unit that I was on was an open bay unit. So it just had the rows of beds on each side mm -hmm. of the ward. Mm -hmm. Didn't have any privacy or anything. Yeah, straight ward. I understand. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, we, I was, most of the shifts that I worked there were the graveyard shifts from the, you know, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. So I spent a lot of time in there in the middle of the night. And uh, this first incident, we had uh, just a handful of patients on the unit that evening. It was uh, somewhere around late November, uh -huh. and uh, it was rather cold. So uh, we had all the lights out except for a light at the very front desk where I was sitting and just reviewing some charts. There was another corpsman with me, but he was off to the side. We had a little wing that ran adjacent to it, and uh, he was by himself. Mm -hmm. So I was out on the unit uh, minding the store, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had this young man, he is about 18, 19 years old, and he had gotten up it was about 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And he um, approached the desk uh, and went past me to the restroom. But he, uh, he looked a little shaky when he went past me. Mm -hmm. And when he came back out, he asked me if I knew who was wandering around in the back of the unit. And I told him that there wasn't anybody back there. Mm -hmm. Well, he proceeded to tell me that he had seen this woman and that she was dressed in antique clothing. 
and that she appeared to be floating in the back, and she was circling around a pool table that they had in the very back for recreation. Bearing in mind, you're in a psychiatric unit here, right? Yeah. So, and so you know, you're taking a little bit of it with a grain of salt. Yes. So, you know, I didn't at first really think anything of it. I thought perhaps he had been dreaming, had just woke up. And so what happened? Well, he was very insistent that something very strange was going on. So I got the other corpsman, and together we went back to the back of the unit with a pair of flashlights. And we did have one little dim light that was on outside of the medicine room. Right. And we didn't see a thing. But this young man was so insistent that he had seen this woman, described her as a period dress that she wore. Yes. And he was so frightened that he refused to go back to his bunk. He, he insisted on sleeping closer to the desk. Oh, well, I, I can't say that I blame him at all, but no, uh, why, why, why would you give it particular credence since uh, it was a psychiatric ward after well, all? Well, this particular ward, it was for what we called adjustment disorders, which uh -huh. was nothing terribly serious. It's just usually young kids that when they got out of boot camp, they get thrown into their first command. And well, okay, so you never saw this entity. I never actually saw it, but it was ex and the next morning. When we mentioned it in the morning report, the the AM crew coming on, right? The uh, the head nurse, uh, he was a lieutenant commander, had been in the Navy for over twenty years. Yes. And he looked at me and he said, "Did you make a note of it?" And I said, "You know, yes, sir." And he said, "Well, that's good." He said, "Because this kind of stuff happens fairly regular." And he said, "Don't be alarmed." And he said it so matter of factly, as if to say, "Yeah, we know what this is." I got gotcha. you. All right. Well, uh, thank you very, very much. Well, huh. on the one hand, you dismiss it because it's a psychiatric patient, but then on the other, there's history. Hmm. I wonder if the sane at death are as likely to incarnate on the other side uh, in some way, if that really is the other side, as the sane. Hmm. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi there. Hi. What is your name? My name's Virginia. Virginia. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, Virginia, good morning to you. Where Where are you? I'm in Arkansas. In Arkansas. Uh -huh. And uh, what do you? Well, fire away. Okay. Um, this happened two years ago. It was the end of summer, and I had taken my nine-year-old son down to Galveston. The idea was to you know, lay in the sun and relax. Sure. Um, we'd been there a couple of days. We were staying in a beach house, and I decided to take him down uh, to the shoreline to look for shells and things. I always did that. Uh-huh. And um, the low, low tide was at midnight. So we walked down to the shore, and we just had one little regular flashlight. And the moon was about a quarter moon coming up in the east, and it was really sort of surreal, mm -hmm. even at the beginning. Um, we had walked east um, for a long ways and weren't really finding anything, and you know how kids are. He was real jumpy and, you know, thought the crabs were going to bite his toes off or something. You know what and I think, Virginia? I think when, when something is about to happen, there, you said it was surreal. It felt surreal. It was. There's a kind of a, a prequel, you know, a, a sort of a, a something hanging in the air before something happens. That's true. Yeah. And I, I kept looking for something, you know, and he wanted to go back after about the first 20 minutes. After we'd been down there about an hour with me saying, no, let's just walk a little bit more. I had heard him say the words, mom, what's that? About a million times already. <laughs> but he said it again, and it sounded different. You know, his voice changed. And I, I stood up and, and, you know, straightened up and shined the light down the beach. We were headed back west at this time. And um, I saw... First, I saw feet, you know, and as I took a few more steps, you know, there was, you know, the rest of this man laying right where the water meets the sand. Laying? Mm-hmm. Laying on his back, his feet towards us. 
um, laying right where the water meets the sand. Uh huh. And so Appar- I told, apparently alive or dead. Well, it was hard to tell at this point. <laughs> okay. And so to answer my son's question, I said, "Well, you know, it's a man laying in the surf." <laughs> well, you know how. When you shine your light on somebody, you instinctively, you just kind of have this oops reaction, and you shine the light right back off. Right. You know, you're sort of embarrassed that you shined it right in their face. Sure. Well, we walked, you know, a few more steps, and I would kind of, you know, do the light back over that way, and and was trying to kind of keep my son behind me. You know, I call it being in mommy mode. Yep. Uh, but, uh, we got, you know, a few more feet closer and then a few more feet closer. And I was gradually, you know, looking back over there to see if he had moved or anything and he hadn't. And, you know, I was beginning to know that, that it wasn't a man just laying in the surf. I couldn't be that lucky. And the last time I shined the flashlight over there, I saw a wave come over his his head and he made no response and his his arms kind of floated funny hmm. and I knew that he was dead. Uh-huh. Well, I told my son that we needed to go and I had been, you know, plodding along so slow, you know, that, that it scared him, you know, that you know well, how, how about we say. need to go call nine one one. Well I, I didn't say that and I just said we gotta go. Right. <laughs> and uh and I you know grabbed all my stuff and, you know, hop. there was a, a long lot of seaweed that year, you know, and you have, kind of have to jump over this. Yeah. And, uh, and he said, well, why? And I said, well, we need to get back to the house. And um, right when I said we have to go, I heard this man's voice clearly. I mean, just like I can hear you now. Yeah. I heard him say, no, not yet. No, not yet. No. Not yet. And I thought, what? You know, I was, I was like between him and my son. And like I said, I, I call it being in mommy mode. And, and I just, I went anyway, you know, and I kept thinking, you know, I should run right up there and, and check this guy, you know, try to help him. But I just, I don't know how to explain the feeling that you have as a mother. I did not want my son involved in anything. No. Of course not. And so no. then what did you do? Well, without breaking into a dead run, we went back to the beach house. I called 911, right. put my son on the couch. Um, the fire trucks went roaring by. I will say they have great response time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, um Beach Patrol, uh, city, county, everybody was there. And so I got my son situated and I went back down there. Um, Beach Patrol told me that they hadn't even attempted CPR and that I shouldn't feel bad about that at all, um, that I hadn't, you know, because they didn't try. He had been in the water too long, and, yes, he was definitely dead. And they, you know, of course, took my entire life history um, and we stood there and talked for a while, and, and the search and rescue guy and, and one of the other cops pulled the guy up out of the water, and, you know, and laid him on the beach, and I went home. Well, nothing like this has ever happened to me, and, you know, there I was alone, and when I got back to the beach house, my son was sound asleep, and I made a couple of phone calls. I'm sure I sounded hysterical to these people. Sure. And I I sat on the porch, and you know that down on the coast, the wind is always blowing. And I sat there, and I was just crying and crying, and and I was you know like talking aloud and and just really just focused on you know mentally and aloud. Who were you, and what happened? Yes. Because down on the beach, they had sort of one of the cops had said, well, what way is the current going? And one of the men had said, well, he was probably from the state park. And I immediately knew that wasn't right for some reason. I just I just knew that wasn't right. Any more contact with this man or what's left of him? Yes. Um, 
while I was sitting on the porch, you know, saying, who are you? You know, I was just, I just had to know who he was. Right. This figure sort of materialized oh. at the top of the steps. It wasn't like he was, his feet were not on the porch. I don't know how to explain it. Floating? It's sort of. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to explain. When, when you say materialized, uh, fully materialized, as in a solid human being, or sort of no. This, uh, okay, no, I've got it. But very clear though. Yes. Um, and he told me that his name was Michael. Oh. And I said, well, you know, who, what happened, and you know, who were you with? Yeah. Um, where where were you? Because I don't think the state park's right. And he gave me two other names, and the next day, he didn't leave. The next day, he was back and told me to look on a map and showed me um, the next sort of subdivision down west on the beach. Well, what, 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 what had happened to, to, to Michael? He had been down on the beach with two friends. Um, they had been partying some... Um, he didn't go into a lot of detail. I I felt like it was a very suspicious thing. Oh yeah, but I mean, here you are talking to a dead person, not fully materialized in front I know. of you. I mean, aren't weren't you totally freaked? Yes, I was, and I was for a long time afterwards. How long did he remain with you in totality? Until I left. Which this was? Month, he died on a Wednesday night. Yes. At Midnight. I found him actually at 1 a.m. on a Thursday. Um, he had been in the water for a couple of hours. Um, I left that Friday, and he was not identified until um, that Friday when the local paper had a huge article on the front page uh, with his physical description and, and all that kind of, you know, And clothing. his name was indeed Michael. His name was indeed Michael. And why did Michael wish to speak to you? Just to get it right? Was that the idea, the impression you had? Actually, the impression that I had was, this sounds a little crass, but he was really ticked off that he woke up dead. Yeah. He was not happy. Um, I can imagine. Uh, I know. Yes, indeed. Um, it sounds kind of bad to say that. But he but was aware he was dead. I don't think he was at first. God, I think that's, that's really what the no-not yeah. yet yeah. was about. Gotcha, gotcha. I think when he said that was the minute he realized that he was dead. Um, he was also... I think trying to communicate with people that he knew. He had lived down there for half of his life. Did he essentially say goodbye to you? Did, did, did you know, was he aware of when you left? Were you aware yes. of, yes? Yes. And what did he say at the end? I went and I stood at the, the top of the boardwalk that goes down to the beach. Yes. And I could feel his arms around my shoulders like he was giving me a hug. And he actually apologized for having put me through all that. But I think, really, I was the only person that could hear him. And that's why he kept coming back to me. Of course. Did, uh, what, what, so many questions. I mean, if you get to talk to somebody who's dead, did, did you ask any of the questions a person might ask, like, no. They don't answer now, everything. You know, he never told me his last name. Yeah. Well, you had a full-fledged uh, discussion with a ghost. Um, yes. That's one hell of a story, Virginia. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, my dear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you and good night. Uh, it was so, I've heard this many times, that when we die, we don't necessarily understand right away that we're dead. And somehow we manage to reach out and interface... <sighs> with whoever is there, maybe whoever finds our body like that case, to find a body just sitting there sort of swirling around in the uh, near the sand and the surf.